Okay, well, good morning and welcome to SAGE's first webinar. And thank you to Molly Carmichael, principal at Myers Research. So Molly will be sharing with us today insights of how has- Hey Katya, I don't think- No? I, I'm not sure everybody else is in. Okay, I see a couple people replying, so. Uh, okay, sorry. So, I mean, we can either wait right now, I see like the participants are going up, we can give it a minute. Before we hand it over to Molly. Okay, so if okay with everybody, I, I think we don't have everybody yet logged in, but some people will probably join as time goes on in the next few minutes. So again, I'd like to welcome everybody to Sage's first uh, virtual uh, meeting or webinar and a big thank you to Molly Carmichael, principal at Myers Research. Uh, so Molly will be sharing with us uh, today insights of how has COVID-19 impacted the sales activity for the 55 plus consumers? And also what are some of the product changes that we're seeing for the 55 plus due to this pandemic? So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Molly and uh, give her the screen so she can start her presentation. Molly, you wanna take it from here? Okay, great. Sure, of course. Let me make sure I can um, turn that screen back up. Hold on one second. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. And I appreciate everybody for joining us. Let me just get the screen. Um, and you can see the screen. Okay. So we were already sharing. Well, welcome everybody. This is Molly Carmichael. This is our first webinar for SAGE. Um, there are so many things going on out there and I just hope everybody is safe and well and, uh, and enjoying their morning coffee as we dive in. So before we begin, just if you have any questions, as you guys know with Zoom, everybody's been doing this a lot now, just shoot us questions as we're going. Um, at the very end, we'll go through some of those questions. Anything we don't get through, I'll be sure to respond to as well within the next day. Um, but again, we really appreciate everybody for joining us this morning and uh, we'll just pretend like we're all hanging out together. <laughs> so we're going to go into a little bit about uh, us. I'm going to go into a little bit about the market, as I mentioned. We'll go into buyer motivation and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about what's going on with the active adult market. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, product design trends, but really what are the big issues right now with that active adult market and we'll go from there. So as you guys know about uh, Myers Research and Zonda and all of that, we have experts all over the country and I'm just gonna shorten this part of it and just say we're here to help. So anything we can do to help you, um, that's the goal behind Zonda, that's the goal behind uh, Metro Study. Um, gosh, everything is changing so much and I spent a lot of time looking at which uh, communities are actually performing, which uh, neighborhoods are performing within those communities to really kind of understand, have, have sales halted? Has traffic halted? And if so, where? If not, why and where? And let's learn from that. I also pulled for Southern California, um, our consumer research data, and I just looked at sort of pre-COVID uh, kind of second half of 2019. And then in addition to that, we're launching our next survey that's going out actually as we speak. We have quite a few builders already launching. And then uh, one other thing that I have been doing is I've been doing about 50 consumer interviews of adult and conventional, in addition to some realtor research as well and getting some feedback from them as to why, why not and, and what's working there. So it's been really super interesting. Um, just to hear what I thought was the reason and then really hearing from them what the reason is and I'll, I'll share some of that as well. So before we jump in, let's just hit some 
kind of COVID-19 stuff, but also let's look at sort of year over year sales and, and what's going on there. If we look over, if we look at year over year, even today, um, you know, the numbers are great year over year. As everybody knows, everybody had a great first quarter. Uh, it was literally the middle of March, end of March, and of course, it's April that uh, it's just been a whole new world for us. But on the whole, ownership has been on the rise since 2016. Um, prices are still up year over year for uh, not only nationally, but for Southern California. But when we look at prices, I'm looking at prices for a similar product. When I look at median price, we do a slight, we do see a slight decline in median price. I can talk in median price, but that has to do with the size of the home. So we're seeing more multifamily product entering, seeing smaller homes entering. And, and that is important because that means uh, as builders and developers, we're listening to what's going on in the market and we're continuing to change our strategies based on where the demand is. So that's perfect. Um, when we look at a uh, supply and we look at uh, new and existing supply, I mean, depending on the market you look at in Orange County, it's it's really low. And so that's been really positive. Nationally, we're, we're below, a 40% below. By county, um, in some cases, we're substantially below that 30%. So the last thing that's really been playing in our favor uh, for quite some time, and this does mean something for sure for the active adult buyer, for those who are not paying cash, about one in three of consumers in the active adult world uh, have a completely paid off mortgage, as an example. Um, and depending on the price point and the location, we'll see anywhere from 30 to 50% pay all cash. But the other half, interest rates are a big deal. And uh, we've seen great interest rates uh, over the last couple of years, but particularly recently, we're seeing some interesting fluctuation there. But I will say this, the biggest challenge I'm hearing out there uh, again, depending on the down payment, which for this buyer tends to be less of an issue, is there just seems to be more issues just getting financing in, in all categories, frankly. So um, this buyer, the great news is they tend to have high net worth. They tend to come in with higher down payments and things like that. So I've yet to hear any issues uh, on this side, both from the realtors that I've talked to and from consumers as well. There's just certainly a pause. So let's look at COVID-19 and I'm going to hit just some staggering numbers that'll just, you know, make you pause and probably say a prayer, but uh, you know, these numbers are phenomenal. And, and when we look at um, California and the U S I think the most staggering thing, everybody wants to do these percentages of the population is, and I'm hearing stuff like, well, it's only, you know, 1% here and 4% here. The reality is we've seen, close to 60,000 deaths in a, year, in a, in a month, and, and that's national. Um, in California, actually, I think um, Governor Newsom did a, a great job in sort of closing it down quickly, and I'm not gonna suggest that even 1,809 deaths is uh, okay. You know, it's, it's tough, but it really is, as a percentage of California, uh, it's, Luckily, we don't look anything like the numbers in New York and some of that. New York is about half uh, of the deaths nationwide. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty staggering thing. And as you know, uh, it's the most staggering for those that are 60 and older. And so it's, it's what is causing the slowdown in the market. Well, I mean, obviously this is a big part of it, but we're gonna talk about more of the implications there. Um, the good news is, and the thing that I would underscore is for California, it's actually uh, very good by comparison. On this page, you can actually see the impacts of uh, cases throughout the California region. Um, LA, logically speaking, because we have more population, is the heaviest hit as a county. Um, but when you really look at the numbers as a percentage by million, it's, it's actually very, very low. Uh, and we want to keep it that way. So, and that's really what's going on. So if we look at per million in population, it's 0.1% of the population has contracted the virus to date in California. So uh, that's great. And I know Governor Newsom wants to keep it that way. And so now it's, it's what's next and how does that impact us all doing our businesses and things like that. And talk a little bit about how consumers have responded to that. 
how realtors have responded to that and, and some of those other things. So definitely there's a lot of discussion how the four phases that he's talking about is going to be rolled out. Uh, the very first phase, um, of course, getting all the right things in place like uh, testing and things like that. We hear that testing is readily available, but for anybody who's tried to get a test in California, uh, you know, it's like calling the Pope. It's, it's very difficult to get a test in California. And uh, unless literally, and for somebody who had a cold in the last month, I'll quote my doctor in my teleconference. He said, well, you know, until you get to the point where you um, stop breathing or you have serious issues breathing, uh, we really can't test you. <laughs> I was like, he said, so, you know, reach out to us at that point. I said, well, at that point, I'm probably going to head to uh, the emergency room, but thank you. And of course it was nothing and I was fine, but, but it's, it's pretty wild what's going on out there. So in the meantime, let's look at some of the, the big changes, obviously, um, containment measures, social distancing is definitely going to stay through this month. And I think it's probably going to stay through the summer. Uh, testing timelines are definitely shortening and they're looking for the vaccine, but, uh, you know, I, I think we're a long ways away from that as well. Um, construction workers are still going forward so that's fine and as you look at that i think that's been great amazing things have been put in place i think uh for a lot of the job sites where everybody has to check in they're requiring obviously masks for everybody social distancing is required um we do a call every week with all the division presidents not just for california but throughout the country it's been really impressive uh to see how quickly people have put great practices in place. Um, but from an economic standpoint, I'm going to show you the real numbers on this. Just don't trust the stock market. Um, thankfully, we have uh, some great government initiatives going in to help uh, soften the blows. And we're going to talk about that, which is why when we look at unemployment numbers, I don't know that we can compare those apples to apples, but job losses is, is pretty darn significant. But I'm going to show you, I don't know that it's as bad as it looks, but it's, it's still tough, no question. So when we look at unemployment today and we take into account the furloughs, uh, the implied unemployment today is around 20%, but with the furloughs, we're really at about 14%. Now, if you look at the last peak uh, for the last recession, it was at about 10%. But I do think that there's another portion of this um, where I think we're probably closer to like, 8% because with the unemployment and with the additional uh, kind of security blanket that uh, the government's provided us, to make it very short, a lot of businesses that have not chosen to go the furlough route, which means they're going to cover their medical care and uh, insurance benefits, they've said, hey, take, take the time off, uh, take, you know, until we get our arms around this. And the reality is, you can still come back to work in two months, but we are going to lay you off. And, and I know so many instances like that, but quantifiably, Allie and our, our research team, the real number is 14%, but there's this other number that we really can't get our arms around. And that's the number uh, where employers have said, take the time off until we reopen. And then of course you can come back, but it doesn't include medical. I've also heard very consistently of employers saying, hey, we've asked employees to come back. And they've said, no, I'm getting more money on unemployment and with the benefits until this is over. I'd actually like to stay on unemployment. So they've kind of created this uh, very uh, false negative in the unemployment world. And it's, it's really hard to get your arms around. So, uh, so when we look at overall labor growth or, or job growth. It's pretty crazy when we go back to, again, that uh, the peak of uh, employment change or the loss in 2008, you can see we're just over 700,000 in loss. Um, and that's, that was staggering. I mean, that was, that was definitely the worst we'd all seen in our careers for sure. Uh, when we look at that today, um, it's pretty darn close. And that was in a single month. Uh, but again, I want to underscore the fact that um, we've kind of set it up for this because we have 95% of people at home. So it's pretty crazy. So obviously look for um, some changes there. You can actually see what it looks like by sector nationally. Um, and obviously the leisure and hospitality were going to absolutely hit the hardest. 
and these are the markets that have been hit the hardest. Obviously, a market like Las Vegas, uh, it's got to be a ghost town. But certainly, LA and Orange County are amongst uh, the top. We just have so many uh, people per, we have so many people within each one of those counties. Uh, it's definitely less devastating than it might be for a market like Las Vegas. Um, the other thing that, that I really looked at too is as we look at it throughout the country, you can see there are other, there are other states that are far more devastated than we are. Um, again, and I think the softening of the blow with some of the um, things that the government's put into place is, is really still helping that. So again, as I mentioned up here, I think it feels more like eight to 10%. And luckily, uh, people are covered at least in the interim. We also have 80% of Americans receiving checks. Um, so that's obviously, you know, been something that people have been talking about and it's definitely been appreciated during this very tough time. And you can actually see what the numbers look like depending on what your income is, if you have children. And while this may not be specific to our 55 plus market, it is specific to keeping the economy strong and at least keeping things going. And so that's why I'm kind of touching on some of that stuff. Um, same thing as it relates to um, late fees or anything related to mortgages, uh, whether you, it's Fannie or Freddie or banks that are um, supporting loans. There's a, there's a lot of people out there that are actually reaching out and they're, they're putting a pause on some of their payments. Uh, even student loan debt has been suspended until uh, the 30th. So that's kind of interesting. And even as it relates to credit card debt or auto loans, they have the flexibility of up to 120 days. So again, a lot of stuff out there on pause and there to support people uh, during this tough time, albeit we all are very, very aware and watching the news 24 seven, uh, watching these numbers continue to go up. So it's a little scary. As it relates to some of the rent communities, the same there, um, there is a misperception that all rental communities can actually put their rent on delay. And it also, there's a misperception that they don't ever have to pay their rent, but they do have to pay their rent. They're just delaying that payment. And it's about half the rental communities that actually can have uh, those delays. And even those that aren't um, agency backed rental communities, um, there are additional things I think that a lot of those um, uh, owners are actually giving some relief there too, just knowing everything that's going on. The big issue for our buyer more than anything, and that's that 55 plus consumer, is really what's going on in the stock market. So at the all time low, we went from close to 30,000 in the Dow Jones down to about 18.5. And that was substantial to this buyer and not because they need that money to live on, but it's the confidence to make a move and do I wait? or do I move now? And I would tell you that's the biggest thing that I'm hearing from consumers is they're more concerned about this and okay, then maybe I need to work longer. So I was going to retire this year or I was thinking about retiring at the end of this year and now it's, you know, maybe I need to stay in the job, you know, in the, uh, the job world for another two, five years until the market comes back. So that's having a big impact. And as you guys know, it's more than COVID-19 hitting this. I mean, oil prices are just plummeting and that's been a big part of uh, this combined with COVID-19. So it's just been a perfect storm, unfortunately. But if we look at the major factors to consider with all of that, I mean, I think it's important to note, 95% of consumers have been asked to stay at home given all of the things that are going on. Storefronts are completely closed. Uh, and by appointment only, you know, there's some really interesting and great things going on out there with new virtual solutions. And uh, that's been very impressive, not just in the sales world, but in the operations world. And I think those solutions are going to be here to stay. So when the market comes back, I think we're going to see even a more robust set of tools. Uh, in addition to, we're going to see some pent up demand. And I heard that a lot from consumers and, and realtors. When we asked them, where do you think the market's going to be in three months? I would say half of them basically said, um, I think the market's going to be better and I think there's going to be pent up demand and things will be good. The other half said, you know, I, I think it's going to be tough at least through to the end of the year. So um, the other thing too is, um, you know, I think out there on the job sites and things like that, I mean, there's there's just a big focus on on safety and making sure that we're doing this right and well for all the re reasons uh, we talked about at the very beginning because those numbers are so staggering. 
Other big issues that we have to look at today as it relates to the whole new home sales world is the international migration has halted. Now, most age qualified neighborhoods, and there's a whole cultural thing behind this, it, they do tend to attract like 95% Caucasian, where when we see, you know, Asian or African American or East Indian, they, <clears throat> they're more likely to want the opportunity to have family members living with them, you know, for a variety of reasons. And so, uh, depending on whether you're looking at age targeted or age qualified for that 55 plus market, um, that's whether or not this is a huge impact or not. But markets across the country, Florida and Northern and Southern California, Chicago, Houston, Boston, New York, uh, are the markets that are hit the most by this kind of halting uh, in international migration. And if you look at some of the numbers in uh, like Central Irvine for the sales there, I mean, in some cases I've seen weeks with negative sales for all of the projects out there selling, let alone uh, you know, all that's going on in this category. So it's, it's a pretty big deal. And I think it's more the age targeted communities that are being impacted by this. Uh, but I'm certainly seeing the numbers slow down a little bit in the age qualified, but we'll talk a little bit about that specifically. The other part of this is a lot of times when that active adult consumer goes out to look for a home, they usually aren't going to move in immediately or at least uh, 30 to 50%. And in some cases it can be greater than that. They're going to buy that home. They're going to slowly move into it over time. And once they finally retire, uh, they're going to go to that home. And about 45% uh, of the shoppers who took our survey are actually fully retired. But there's that other large portion uh, that isn't quite fully retired. So they're either going to uh, telecommute, which we're all doing today, <laughs> or um, you know, continue to drive in you know, maybe a few days a week or something like that. So, I think there's that try and buy uh, in addition to the second home market that really has been largely impacted too. Now, if we look at sales, uh, you can kind of see what's been going on as far as our uh, sales index. I mean, this is pretty staggering when you look at this nationwide for March. Um, <clears throat> and April actually just doesn't look that much better. But once again, you have to remember, we have 95% of people at home. And so that, that's something that you have to look at. In addition to that, if you look at listings, um, and this is what I talk about for the 55 plus consumer and all consumers, look at what's happened to listings. And that's a big part of too why our total sales activity, I think has dropped as a, as a market. When we talk to consumers about um, actually going out and potentially buying a home, I really thought I would hear a lot, particularly from that 55 plus consumer share that uh, they were very concerned about their own health going out the door um, and you know meeting with realtors and walking through a model and all of those things and that really wasn't the issue the bigger issue was having people walk through the home that they were going to sell and being uncomfortable with potentially you know multiple people coming into their home that was a far bigger issue than uh, them actually going to and having a one-to-one -one discussion uh, there. And we asked about, um, you know, if you're, you know, the models are cleaned and it's gloves and, and mask and all of that, or a virtual presentation. And most of the 55 plus consumers are, I could do a virtual presentation for sure, but for the 55 plus consumer, it was very crucial that they actually see, touch and feel the models and be sure they knew it. And we'll talk a little bit about the ones that said that they would in fact go through a full purchase virtually and, and what was required there because that was interesting. There were a few of them, but not a ton. The good news is that interest in housing remains. This is just one of the, the Google searches we had on sort of um, should I buy a house, but I also looked up uh, homes for sale um, all of those and they all look just like this. So there's a nice spike when you look at that index going back over the last year or so. Uh, certainly people are still looking for a home and on that specific note when we talk to consumers, um, consumers said yes, no, I'm absolutely still interested in those that had already visited, gone down the road, um, they picked the plan they wanted. Those buyers are still there and they're still buying homes but they are pausing a little bit to see if they can get a better deal as a result of what's going on. And I think that's a part of it. Um, so we're definitely starting to see um, 
uh, requests for incentives, and I'm seeing some pretty hefty incentives too as, as a result of that. So as we look at, again, 95% of our consumers are at home, your storefronts are closed, and it's by appointment only. Um, traffic's been down by about 50 to 75%. We've seen sales down by about 50% over the last month. Um, that does vary by project for sure. And in some cases, I saw projects actually from a sales absorption standpoint rival the prior, prior month. And we'll talk about those that have done that. There's specific things related to that. But in no case, um, so sales are down in the active adult world. If I look at just the, the last month, uh, they're down by about 9% based on sales absorptions, but that's looking at the combination of sales that happened in February uh, as well as March and April. So we had a great sort of February and a half of March. And then if we blend in the rest of that, it's about 9% um, overall. But if we look at just the last month, it's pretty substantial. But the one part I want to underscore is nothing's down 95%. And I think in talking to a lot of um, our industry out there, not only locally, but throughout the country, I think people are really pleasantly surprised that traffic is still happening. And the traffic that's showing up, it's just the real traffic. We aren't seeing that traffic, uh, what I, I put them in the looky loo category. And the buyers that are showing up, they're ready to buy. And so, um, so it's really interesting, and I, I want to note if we're seeing sales in that 30 to 50 percent category, it pretty much ties with the number of people that were coming into your sales offices before that were actually ready to buy versus the looky loo. So it was about um, anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of all traffic coming in in Southern California that were ready to buy. The rest of them were, hey, if you did something compelling, I would buy, but maybe not today. So it's kind of interesting when we really dig deep into the numbers to see what's going on. But the one thing that we do know, uh, given that we're all, um, you know, huddling in our homes today and doing so much in our homes today, home's never been more important. And I think we're all looking around, around at, um, I can't tell you for myself <laughs> um, how small I feel like my home is more than ever before, just spending 24 hours seven in it. And I have to believe that doesn't change at all uh, for that 55 plus consumer. And I think we're going to see a lot of uh, product features and things like that change as a result of that. Um, the things that they want out of their homes uh, will be interesting. And it'll be interesting to see those numbers and how they trend over the next month or two as we uh, relaunch the survey as well. But so let's talk about why they're not buying and what came up. So certainly market uncertainty. When and where is that going to shift? Investment challenges were without a doubt probably the biggest thing impacting the market. So the stock market is really hard to track right now because it keeps bumping up and down uh, by about a thousand points. I think it's gone between 23,000 and 24,000 for the last two weeks. Job loss, that's really about uh, uncertainty. But again, remember almost half of these consumers are already retired but it's just the concern for what job loss means for the whole market and their investments. Um, there's a concern for potential foreclosure activity. Will that impact price? And of course, there is a concern for potential price declines. But I think more of what I heard was not necessarily just the price decline that could impact their home. They're also very interested in what it means for them as far as price opportunity. And they're willing to wait a few months to see what that means because none of these buyers have to move. They love the home that they're in and that's probably our biggest challenge with the 55 plus market is they just don't have to move and your biggest competition is the home that they're actually sitting in. Again, I had those comments of I just don't like the idea of somebody walking through my home with all the things going on as it relates to virus. Um, and certainly uh, they're the least likely to buy um, all virtual unless, this was pretty interesting, unless it's a trusted brand they know um, and they've been there before. So I had a few people say, no, I would buy a home from, and I, I won't use a specific brand name because I know them and I've walked all the rooms and I love their homes. Now it's just kind of working through the negotiation details. So if it's a trusted brand they know, they've been there before, those are the sales I, that I think are still a great potential. The hardest ones will be getting them out there for the first time. And I think we're seeing that both uh, 
in the active adult world, but I think we're also seeing that in, in really all age groups, family groups, you name it. So if you assume America starts to open up in May, um, we definitely don't think it's a, a V recovery. I think that's too sharp. A U is kind of too much time at the bottom. And a lot of people have really talked about it really being more of a swoosh. I've had multiple consumers say, I think it's going to be a W with a swoosh on the end <laughs> because you know the market's coming back up because we're starting to see businesses reopen. And if there is any sort of um, backlash and um, reoccurrences in the virus, which there's great concern about that, and we could see it drop down a little bit, but again, uh, seeing it still recovering in that 16 to 20 months. So you can see <clears throat> there is a potential of this kind of pop up here, then sort of an awakening and a, a, again, a soft landing as we get to the end. So plan on at least through the end of the, the year of this being a little bit um, more cautious and potentially all the way into next year. So let's look at demographic drivers. So that was the tough news. That was the hard news. That's what's going on in the economy. That's what's going on with COVID-19. Uh, and it certainly wasn't expected, particularly given we had the lowest unemployment in February of this year uh, that we've seen in our country for, for 40 years. I mean, it's, it's been pretty incredible. Um, and this one, nobody could have planned for this. But let's look at some of the demographic drivers. So the demographics are super favorable for 55 plus. Over 40% of the population is 55 plus today, and that's total population. If you looked at the total population over 25, we're over 50% today. So it is the market to be in today. And by 2050, it's almost 50% of the total population will be 55 plus. It's a market you definitely want to continue to be focused on and really understand uh, and plan for it. And interestingly enough, you'll see uh, part of it's because we're living longer, um, but you, you'll see the numbers, it's pretty crazy. So what, I'm, what I've done here on the next couple of slides is I'm gonna compare the growth from 2010 to 2020, both nationally and then for Southern California, you can see some of the numbers there. So on the left and the right for both the nation and for Southern California, the growth looks pretty similar but the numbers are absolutely the strongest for the 55 plus market. And so when you look at the numbers for these two slides, that's the impact of today. That's what we're dealing with today. And so capturing the 55 to 65 market with a 21% growth, I mean, you're kind of in your prime right now. This is the time to hit. The 66 to 75 age group, well, it's 46% for Southern California and 48% for the nation. The reality is those consumers, most of those consumers have already made a move. So the average age to, to look for a home when you're looking at retirement is 57 to 62. The average age to purchase that home is 62 to 67, depending on the location. We'll find that consumers that are actually commuting an hour plus tend to be a little bit younger because they want to retire and they're looking for more financial security and they'll actually buy that home sooner. If you look at the coastal markets like Orange County, LA, kind of going up and down the coast where prices are much more expensive, you'll actually start to see that average age to buy and settle is around 65 to 67. So it's a little bit older. And uh, part of that is because they're, they're more affluent. Uh, part of that is because they're working longer and they don't want to leave that house. And so there's some di interesting dynamics there. And then of course the 76 plus is 20 to 21%. The one thing I would look at, uh, given that we're not just looking at for sale housing for our audience, is assisted care is going to just skyrocket. Um, I think just the whole, um, uh, aging in place, all of that kind of stuff. I think we're going to see some tremendous opportunities in Southern California and the nation. So now let's look at the growth as we go into, um, and I covered all that just now. Now let's look at sort of the growth throughout the country and how Southern California is so well positioned. So if we look at that 55 plus population in 2023, once again, I don't think you could be in a better location if you're focused on the 55 plus market. And if we look at ownership for the 55 plus market, once again, high equity, high net worth. And again, I don't think you could be in a better location uh, as well. 
as we look to that growth for 2020 to 2025, we start to see some changes there. So again, if you look at the nation, the 56 to 65 age groups actually starts to decline ever so slightly. And same thing for, for Southern California. So it's actually going to decline about two, uh, one to 2% depending on Southern California versus the nation. The age groups for 66 to 75 for Southern California is still a big number. Uh, it's almost, uh, it's a little over two times that of the nation. So we're gonna continue to see some really heavy growth in that 66 to 75. And again, uh, uh, some pretty great growth in the 76 plus. So we're looking at those, I think too. Um, but again, that is the, this is the silver lining for the 55 plus market. The opportunity and the, the depth of demand here will continue to be great just given the growth over the last 10 years. And certainly we're gonna continue to see some growth in the future. So just to compare those two years as far as growth goes, you can see the blue line represents the future and the green, the green line actually represents that price. So the other thing I wanted to just point out is again, huge equity. If you just look at home prices and the equity out there for that 55 plus consumer, uh, that's a great opportunity. About half the uh, home price value uh, usually is a great indicator for where you should be positioning uh, your next price points for those 55 plus consumers. They, traditionally want to cash out anywhere from uh, 30 to 50% of their equity or their financial security. So that's a great uh, indicator. And then if you look at that just throughout the country, you can see it's very heavy um, for California. And interestingly enough for the Northern states, if you look up into Minnesota, Detroit, um, some of those you, you can actually see some uh, pretty heavy net worth up there. Theirs may not be sitting in home price uh, and more in savings for sure. And that drives the Florida markets, the, you know, the um, Las Vegas market, the Arizona markets and things like that. And you can see a very, very high net worth sitting in Southern California as a whole with all of that red. The other thing that I wanted to point out is we do lose a lot of consumers to Las Vegas and Phoenix, um, unless we start to really come up with choices for them to stay. So I do think an important factor to look at as we're looking at the active adult market for sure. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is when you look at the Southern California region, how has that 55 plus consumer generally been migrating? And if you look at all of the purple, those are the highest price point locations for that 55 plus consumer and how they've settled thus far. If you look at the green and the blue, green is more likely to have uh, age qualified neighborhoods and attract uh, more of those lifestyle communities to those locations. The, the blue is more uh, kind of larger lots, value suburban, and those yellow pockets are more rural hillside settings with larger lots suburban locations for those older buyers. So that was kind of interesting to see how they were settling thus far and how that all relates. So when you look at this, we've got a couple of different consumer groups and how uh, consumers are moving today. We've got that local move luxury lifestyle, which is more in an urban environment. And I think we're going to see consumers being far more cautious going into high density locations, just given what's recently gone on. And um, the most common is staying in their current home or actually moving in and around the location uh, that they live in today. And if they can find product, uh, in the price point that they can do that with. Uh, that's why some of those communities have been so successful. Um, but once again, I think there's gonna be more caution for moving or taking higher density solutions just given some of the, the recent things that have happened. Now, all bets are off if their kids move and their grandkids move with them because we definitely will see, uh, we'll continue to see those baby chasers out there. And then there's the group that just has to move uh, to protect their financial security. Uh, those consumers are likely to end up working longer um, given the results of COVID-19 to see if they can stabilize uh, their financial security. But I will say this, it's so important for your sales teams and for the communication to underscore for them and point out to them, this is a long-term purchase. You know, what are they waiting for? And by the way, the home they're purchasing, if that home price comes down, so is the home that they're going to sell. And do they wanna get their equity out now or do they wanna wait till that equity continues to, to drop? And so 
there's a sensitivity in how you're sharing that. You can always point to third party sources to actually prove that from the medical. But that always surprises me. And it really surprised me last time we heard the very same sentiment is my house is worth so much more than this. I don't want to sell it because it just dropped 10 or 20%. Um, well, the reality is you're getting, you know, 20 or 30% off the home that you're purchasing. So those are the benefits and those are the kinds of things that you want to look at. Obviously, this last one are, are really common with some of the, the bigger master plans or lifestyle is such a big focus, and yet you still get a, a really great price that goes with it. So the desert markets, obviously the Inland Empire are great solutions for that. And it's been interesting to see uh, some of the sales absorptions there, um, some doing very, very well, and those are specific price points. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, other thing that we're gonna talk about too is just the number of people that are saying, hey, I'm going to buy a home where I live now, but it's going to be much smaller. And then I'm going to buy a home uh, where I want to live one day. So uh, that market's still out there. And about one in three of your consumers is actually considering that market as well. So let's look at who's shopping. We're going to look at uh, the U.S. and Southern California as it relates to that. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the parts and pieces there. So the average 55 plus consumer, as many of you know, it takes about two to three years for them to make a decision. I can't tell you how many people I talked to that said, you know, I started looking in 2015 and I made a decision by 2018 or gosh, you know, we're just now finally getting to the end of that road. So it's a very, very long, long decision making process for them. And when we look at actually, um, the top segments for that 55 plus consumer uh, world out there, you'll actually see um, the number one consumer uh, for the 55 plus, it's mature couples. About one in five, um, as I mentioned, are retired nationally. And then I'll show you the actual numbers for Southern California. And it's number four for singles. And most of those singles are actually 45 plus. The number one consumer groups that we wouldn't capture in the 55 plus world is young couples and families finally took first place over this last year. Uh, it used to be the number one shopper out there was mature couples. Uh, so that's a big deal. But the number one buyer has consistently been over the last several years, uh, young couples and families because they have to move. Our biggest challenge again with mature couples is, you know, the competition we have for them is the home that they're living in today. So again, when we look just at mature couples, or when we look at the mature segments, it really is mature couples that were focused on followed by singles. And don't forget on the single category, one in three to four are actually a single female. So that's a big market for sure. And again, uh, we have a pretty big percentage that are actually retired as well. So let's look at buyer motivation. You know, I've talked about this. I talked about this at IBS. I think it's so crucial to talk about this for this buyer group. And I'll go through this quite briefly. If you listen to the last webinar I just did, um, you're going to hear some repeat here, but I think it's so crucial to think about um, when you're actually selling in today's environment. So the big thing is, is what factors are you solving for? There are three very simple ones. Who's going to be living in the home? Is it a single? Is it couples? Uh, do they want the opportunity to accommodate, you know, grandkids or 21 plus year old children to live in-house or just visit? What can they afford? And of course, uh, what is their motivation? What are the pain points that are actually making them consider a move? Is it financial security? Is it, um, I'm downsizing, I just don't wanna maintain this big house anymore. What are those big uh, pain points that are making them move today? And then what drives their customer behavior? And this is probably the most crucial part that I would underscore for your sales teams and um, just how we think about and how we place product, quite frankly. And that's just um, how the brain makes decisions. So I'll go through this briefly, but obviously between left and right brain, left brain is hard facts. Everybody walks out the door with their checklist. This is what I'm actually solving for. But the part that we can't always quantify is that just emotional thing that says, God, this just feels great. Um, one of the people on this call, I'll never forget when she made a very big move with her, her husband. Um, it just was the right location, it was the view, it's how the home felt all together. And um, it was an awesome experience, albeit walking out the door. I know in the very beginning for them, it was like, oh my God, what am I doing? And it felt very uncomfortable. But it's that right brain stuff, that, that great design, the, the emotional things that you actually see and feel that aren't on the checklist, that during times like this, 
help you move and make a decision. You have to have that really delightful thing offset that scary thing to actually make the move. And that's why I'm covering this uh, and I continue to cover this. It's so important. So how do you actually help those consumers actually make their, their decisions given both sides of the brain there and, and how important that is? And I would say these first three are also crucial based on the interviews I just did. Give them facts and be a realist um, to actually point out to them, you're making this decision, as I understand it, for the long term. This isn't just about the next year or two as far as the market goes. And uh, realistically, you can wait and wait for home prices to drop, but also the equity in your home could potentially drop too. So you just want to look at the the big picture and be a realist. The worst thing you could do is say, oh no, the market's going to be better in two months. It's going to be fine. Um, you really want to state the facts and then go through that checklist and say, remember, you want to downsize. You want less maintenance. You want all these things. I think we can address this on your checklist. And that's the that's how you can approach the, the left side of the brain. On the right side, that's where if they can't come into the models, the visualization and storytelling is so crucial. Um, the more and more you can have um, examples, I like to call them community ambassadors, just saying exactly what I just shared before is it's such a nervous time to make that decision. But when you get there, it's just such a great experience and you're going to make new friends and, uh, you know, you're going to have the kitchen you always wanted and, you know, you're going to have more financial security, you know, given you're cashing some of that equity out. And uh, most importantly, you're just going to enjoy your life so much more today. And what are you waiting for? So you want to solve for that desire side. So <clears throat> in, in times like this, is one side better? I mean, it really is that how do you create that delight to offset that negative emotion or that concern, all that stuff I covered at the very beginning, we want to offset that with positive. So that's the stuff that drives decisions, that drives loyalty. And it definitely today emotion sells. So I'm a big fan of art and science, uh, but we need that art and design side more than ever, I think, going into what we're faced with today. Because you have two choices. You can drop price. Or you can come with really come in with really special spaces and community features that will help them go, wow, I can do that really with my with my budget. I can I can afford that. That would be great. So um, the other thing I want to underscore too out there, because uh, I'm seeing a lot of it already, I'm seeing a lot of it online, is just be careful not to load the houses up with tons of options and be careful not to eliminate all choice. So if you can go in and if you have to put in flooring to get your, your cabinets in great. Leave the counters uh, for them to choose. Let them do their own backslash. Whatever you can give them a choice in, great. And try not to get so many options into the home where you're all of a sudden at a price point uh, that makes them uncomfortable. That was the biggest thing I've seen in the last two recessions uh, that really challenged so many of the builders. And uh, you know they ended up giving it away. The consumer just isn't one gonna pay for your taste. <laughs> Uh, and the second part of it is part of the joy is is personalizing and some of those things. And so that's a pretty big deal. So know, know what they want and know what they're going to pay for. That's part of what the consumer piece can, can help you do. But the other part of it is as much as you can, uh, give them some part of the decision-making process. So it's really about them. You're going to see fewer cancellations if they get to pick something because uh, it's, it's now their home once they've picked something. Um, the last one is, is, is really what do they want? And we're going to talk a little bit about that in some of the consumer preference pieces uh, pre-COVID-19 and then kind of reading through the lines as to how it's going to go forward. Through the interviews that I did for our um, active adult consumers, interestingly enough, I don't see any change in what they want specifically pre-COVID-19 or in the future. It's really more about the pause that's being uh, created by COVID-19. And I think for the family and for um, some of the other segments, we're starting to see a lot more uh, requests in multiple offices and um, you know the requirement to have obviously gym at home and things like that. So there are bigger factors, I think, for some of these other groups. But let's talk about this 55 plus consumer. Interestingly enough, as we look at um, some of the numbers as far as top motivation to buy, location, of course, is number one, followed by home design. Um, when we asked consumers uh, what they were going to do next, we gave them a variety of choices on how they would move. 
and close to 100% said, gosh, I might even just stay where I'm at. So once again, this underscores your greatest competition is the home that they're in today. Um, only 39% uh, are saying they're going to stay in the area and almost half said they're going to move outside the area. Uh, but 31% said, you know, I may buy something here and buy something uh, in the location that I want to retire in. So, so that, that's a pretty big deal. And of the 88% uh, that actually said they would stay in their current home, um, that should be 88%, not 86. Sorry about that. And um, they're, they're very much aware. Oh, that's what that number is. That 86% is correct, actually. 86% of the total uh, group that took the survey said they were very aware of the benefits of a, of a reverse mortgage. So that tied pretty closely to that 88%. And I'm curious to see if that becomes more and more of a competitive thing uh, for that 55 plus market. So I do think that there's an opportunity to, to create solutions and they could actually be builders and developers solving for the two home location too, which is, you know, all flat or something close to uh, their family or employment. And then also having something not quite as big as they might have chosen, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, maybe in the desert or a destination location. And I think they'd work on both of those. So um, when we look at their furry little friends, uh, just to point that out, um, you know, only 37% don't have a pet. Um, and even of that 37%, it drops to 27% because 10% are planning um, for pets. I would tell you, this is a category where I have seen consumers get really emotionally pulled or connected to a community because that community did something really special. You know, 54% uh, treat those uh, pets like family members, and that's 54% of the, the total group that took the survey. Um, and so it's even greater when you consider of the people that have pets, it's probably more like 65% uh, to 70% uh, that really cherish those animals. And so, I was looking at some fun things that I've seen in master plans throughout the country. And um, those are things that I think people genuinely get excited. I mean, this is a, a point of exercise for the person getting out there, um, but it's also just, it brings you joy uh, to do some of these fun things. So, you know, given our warmer weather conditions, I thought these were kind of some fun ideas. So be thinking about those emotional things as you're designing for things in the future. Clearly this consumer for all the right reasons, they want one story. We did allow them to choose more than one choice. So we definitely had a range of anywhere from two to 24% choose different choices, but it's really only one in four that's saying, hey, I, I'll buy the house with a master on the first level and take that extra space. I cannot tell you how many builders, developers, um, and neighborhoods where they've struggled to sell that second level on the home. Um, and they've had, you know, they'll call me and say, you know, how do we troubleshoot? What's going on here? And the reality is they just don't value that square footage on the second level, like they value that square footage on the first level. So it's okay to do those pop-up homes. That's, that's great. Just realize you're not going to get the price per square foot out of the second level like you are in the first level. And in a lot of cases, I would tell you, um, oftentimes it's almost like giving that space away for free. Um, but that could be that emotional tug to say, hey, that would be a great suite for visitors because this group definitely does want visitors. The other thing I wanted to point out, just given how expensive dirt is in Southern California, is 42% actually uh, will trade off multi-level if you include the elevator. So they want one story or consider that elevator. And this consumer group, um, they all think they're about at least 10 years younger than they really are. Uh, the stairs don't make them nervous and they will take the stairs. The elevator just offsets the fear that, hey, if I needed it one day, um, that's what it does. It also helps with um, just, you know, carrying things up the stairs if there is that, you know, if there is something there with that too. It makes those great locations really work. And I would tell you, if you look at this consumer group and their number one factor that they want is location first, this, that's where this stuff will help to offset location. But if I can take a product and instead of building five to the acre, I can take that product up to 18 to the acre, even in the detached world and include the elevator, the cost of that $30,000, so when you think about that in relationship to density, really goes away. And you have to factor that in when you're thinking about those kinds of choices. What does it do for my density? 
And if I take the $30,000, if I'm paying, you know, four or 5 million an acre, it's probably worth considering. Um, we did have one in four actually say that they would pay the 30,000 for the elevator. Where I've seen the, uh, the worst success with elevators is when you option it. Again, you have to think about it as a trade-off uh, for that lifestyle. And oh, by the way, that's that right brain factor. That's so cool that when you buy that home and you say, and check this out, I have an elevator in my house. Um, it also uh, protects and actually adds to their uh, resale value over time. And that can be proven. Again, you can point to third party sources on that. So that's a pretty great way to look at it. So include the elevator. Uh, you could end up giving that space away if you don't. Um, and I really do think longer term for the right locations, uh, that should really offset uh, and give you quite a few benefits. The other thing to think about is, you know, this consumer group wants no maintenance. They don't mind at all smaller yards, but you definitely have to do two very big things at design it for entertainment and design it for privacy. The outdoor space is probably the biggest compromise this consumer is going to make because the inside's all new. It's the kitchen they've always wanted. It's the space they've always wanted. It's completely designed for them. They have the hardest time giving up the idea of their big backyard or reading the paper you know, outside or those family gatherings they had outside. So being able to really demonstrate that's so important. And so I, I use this image a lot and you can see this is just a covered outdoor terrace area with a five foot setback, but it sure shows you that I can see a lot of people. It lives really well. It's private. I love the fact that they did the little water feature there. Uh, it really helps to kind of demonstrate that privacy and entertainment factor in a very small space. And um, the other thing, interestingly enough, this ties perfectly with our national numbers, but for Southern California for the 55 plus or for uh, the boomers um, here, 56% actually want modern versus 45% want traditional. So definitely we're trending far more to the modern side. And, and again, in talking to consumers about why modern versus traditional, um, you know, it's, it tends to be less cluttered, more functional. There's more glass, more light, uh, cleaner lines. I heard cleaner lines constantly uh, with this group, uh, which is interesting. And I just think once again, uh, they want a younger, fresher feel, and, and I think this supports that. The other part to underscore is if you're competing with anything in the active adult world or frankly even in the resale world, uh, about 90% of your competition in Southern California, if not 95% of your competition is going to be traditional. So that's something to think about as well. Um, as it relates to the exterior, it definitely does lean more to the traditional. What's really interesting here, um, and you're going to see this in the top motivation as it relates to home features, I would say the biggest opportunity for the active adult world for Southern California is just better exteriors. And I can't tell you how many times I heard that. So um, they, while they're leaning more to traditional, um, again, 95% of your competition out there is uh, more traditional. And with 43% that want a slightly more modern exterior and it's more somewhat modern, not extremely modern or very modern. Um, I do think there's a, a great niche there more people want diversity on their street scene, but I will tell you the 55 plus consumer, uh, we saw a slightly higher percentage uh, leaning more towards uh, homogeneous styles that, are, that blend together or a little bit more similar in style at 39%. So, um, so again, while some of this is, is a two story on that page, it's clean lines, fresh design, uh, whether it's transitional or truly modern, um, just bringing in sort of a, a new look and feel for them. This feels younger, it feels hipper. And again, I think that plays with the, the right <clears throat> brain mentality of, of getting that consumer to move for something uncool, new and different. Um, certainly this consumer, even though there's only two of them in there, they want organization. Um, so the back office as it relates to laundry, you certainly can be a lot more efficient with your, your laundry size, but they want space for all those things like bottled waters and, uh, and all the things. It, it's the home hub. It's really what the garage used to serve. And now this is kind of the, the core for the house. Um, I'm so surprised when I talk to people and they're planning their retirement and I look at the homes that they purchase or what they're looking at purchasing. Oftentimes it's these kind of spaces where they really go overboard and they want something fantastic because they've been struggling with these spaces for the last uh, 30, 40 years of their life. 
Um, other categories, if they want more affordable that you can start to shrink, um, I addressed this a little bit more on some of the, the things that are trending in and out. Um, this consumer, actually more of them do still want a bathtub in their master, but if you don't do the bathtub in their master, do something fun in their secondary bathrooms. I mean, you could do the freestanding tub in the secondary, and again, that's that right brain wow, that like, oh, that's so great. Um, not just doing a standard secondary and then something uh, better on the master. <clears throat> and I love this image here on the right with the walk-in shower, just doing something a little bit more special. If you're taking the tub out of the master, uh, do something a little bit more exciting for that shower as well. Specialty spaces that are actually gonna continue to gain interest, and this is a result of COVID-19. Um, we definitely saw some interest here as it relates to this one specifically. And that is if I can't go to the gym and wellness and all of those things are so important to me, you know, I got to figure out how to make gym work at home. Uh, this is definitely trending up on Google Trends. Uh, so be thinking about how you're going to solve for this. Um, they want the social aspect more than ever for this buyer for sure. Uh, but wellness is going to come into play well before uh, uh, the social aspect for sure. Um, the other thing with this, this consumer group <clears throat> for the 55 plus, which is really interesting, is their current households up above here, so multi-generational families today for those boomers, 17% um, either have a 21 plus year old child or grandparents living with them. The big number here is this 11% here. So it's the 21 plus children. Now in their next home, <clears throat> that's where you're gonna see a pretty big drop. So right now they have 11% in their home and they're looking to drop to 3% for that 21 plus year old child. The, the parents potentially living with them goes up a little bit as you can see here. So the net to net is 17% versus 11% for the future. So that's really interesting to actually see those numbers. The, the part that I found pretty fascinating was the numbers down here is we asked them who's gonna live with them in the future. Um, and we still saw, they wanted the potential of that 21 plus year old child if they had to come back, 30% still wanna plan for that. Um, while only 8% are you know, immediate, they're planning for the potential, 20% are planning for the potential of that being a need. And then you have these other ones here, which are family or, or friends. And so that's again, where we look at all people shopping for home in that boomer category. Uh, those are your answers there. So just that master, plus the den and a guest bedroom is so important. But look at the numbers that want actually the multi-gen suites. These are bigger than the overall numbers. <clears throat> and you would think the numbers would be bigger for families, but they're actually pretty big in this category. And again, qualitatively, when we talk to consumers about what they wanted in their home, the biggest wows were, I want a, a suite for people to visit that they can kind of lock off and have their own privacy. And so again, no matter where that was at, that was a pretty big deal. And these numbers are much bigger, I think, than the national numbers, um, particularly this one with exterior access. That exterior access for those multi-gen suites for this consumer does two things. It allows them to give a pretty um, exciting space for people to come visit and, it, and, and they want people to come visit. But the second part of this is, it's, is it also protects potential financial security. If I was gonna rent out one of my rooms, God forbid, I, a spouse were to pass or something like that, I have that additional financial security too. Uh, so that's a really big deal. And there's no surprise this one's at 93% because they want everything on the first level. So obviously having a guest bedroom, um, I'm surprised that's not 100%, frankly. The other thing too is it relates to home technology that's definitely expected. For boomers in this market, you can actually see the ones that are most important. It doesn't surprise me at all that the safety factor is uh, number one. So almost 100% want that you know, virtual camera at the front and the back door. Um, those are sort of no brainers. And then you can see how those actually change as we go down. Um, but they also want the flexibility to personalize. This consumer, uh, I would not assume that they're not savvy from a techn technological standpoint, uh, but I would assume that they want more uh, personalization and for you to do a little bit more of that. And if it makes your life better, just point out how you're doing that. And I think you'll get paid for that, but don't go overboard again. So you're taking away from the categories that do matter most to them, like the kitchen and entertainment spaces. 
Um, as it relates to solar, uh, it was fascinating to me for Southern California boomers that uh, a big percentage of those are actually, um, they want uh, uh, solar. So 49% said that they would pay for it. Another 39% of your boomers in Southern California uh, said that they would pay for net zero as well. So I think the, the numbers we had for solar were about 25,000 and I think net zero was somewhere around 30 to 35,000. And I do know that there's different levels of that and depending on how big the home is, how that might potentially change. One of the other things that I think will, will change and I heard this actually in our interviews is they said, well, I wish I would have planned for a home battery or a home generator because uh, God forbid something were to happen there. I would have liked to have had that as an option and built that into my purchase price. So, so be thinking about some of that stuff too. Um, wellness obviously is a, is a huge one and, and sort of a no brainer in this category. It's a four, it's a $4.2 trillion business today, but features like, um, uh, as we get into, you know, the built in sauna, I mean, that is a total right brain trigger for sure. If that's something special you can build in with just a walk in shower, those could be more of those luxurious price points to really, uh, send an incredible message there. But the other part of it too is just simple things like, like water filtration and air filtration. There's a lot of great companies out there doing uh, stuff in these categories. So whether you do them independently on your own or you work with companies like a Delos who's put together packages here or not, uh, water and air, I, I can't think of anything more, more valuable. Um, so you can see some of the big factors here. Um, plastic bottles are terrible for you. And then when you just think about the fact that your skin's your largest organ, Definitely, that's a big deal. And a clean air, I don't even know why, you know, everybody gets that, but just concentration, focus, wellness. And when you think COVID-19, you know, you don't want to sit around your house in a mask or having people come in. And <clears throat> if you have something constantly cleaning the air, uh, as an example with Delos, their goal is to keep the air at 92% or cleaner. And you physically can see that actually on your phone and uh, see it really taking effect. And so there's some really great tools out out there and a lot of uh, great companies really focusing in this space. Uh, so I think you're gonna see a lot of competition here. The other thing that I have found is a big change, particularly with virtual purchasing and getting people more comfortable with making decisions faster and going through it is where brands didn't, uh, brands kind of fell out of favor about five to 10 years ago because everybody could go online and find you know everything that they wanted. Brands are definitely back into favor because we're purchasing so much online. So if I know oh, I can trust Kohler, I, er, <clears throat> everything I have is Kohler, I know it's going to put that in my new house, I don't, need to, I don't even need to see it. Same thing with uh, GE, Whirlpool, Moen, all of those brands actually ranked very high. So be very aware of the brands that are special, and we do have all of that in our survey and how important those are, even as it relates to kitchen appliances and things like that. Some other kind of special features that I think uh, COVID-19 or not, um, every space you can actually place storage, place it there. It's huge. Um, this is a really great one that I'm seeing a lot in sort of the Texas and East Coast markets uh, where you actually don't have basements, just like our market. Uh, that attic storage obviously is a, a natural function. But the other thing uh, there is, um, <laughs> my poor kids actually they have to be the ones who climb up on that ladder and they're pulling the Christmas stuff down for us. And, and soon enough, uh, they're moving out and they're not gonna be here. So I don't know who's gonna be at the end of the ladder as you're throwing those big boxes down and they practically crush you as they're coming down that ladder. So, uh, you know, features like this are just great, not only for bringing boxes back up into the attic, but certainly dropping those down. And it's, it's pretty reasonable, so that's a big deal. My son's walking by me right now with a smile laughing at me because <laughs> he knows what it's like to have to deal with those boxes. So anyway, so as, as we're getting close to some of the wrap up here, another really fascinating thing for our boomers is I, it was surprising to me again, we let them choose more than one as far as garage features. 47% um, wanted a three car garage and they were willing to pay $60,000 for it. And, and I can't tell you how many consumers said to me, I really wanted a three car garage. There just is hardly any product out there with three car garages. So uh, that's certainly an opportunity out there. And as you all know, that third car garage is oftentimes one, is, one car is for a storage. So you either solve for that storage space of that size um, or you give them a three car garage. And it looks like there's pretty big demand out there. 
The other thing I wanted to point out too is that uh, man caves are big with this boomer virus. 61% said they'd pay an additional $10,000 to take one of those garage spaces and turn it into a man cave. So that, that outdoor space is great. Almost half want that uh, electric vehicle charging station. You should just do that anyways. We're going that direction anyways and more and more people are gonna have that and it's really inexpensive to do. Um, I was surprised to see that only 2% wanted that, you know, uh, the, the pad with a hookup or their RVs, but 31% said they would spend another $10,000 uh, to get a super garage and another 20% or one in five said they'd pay another $30,000 to have an RV garage um, for those that are sort of traveling throughout. So those are some pretty interesting numbers too. So if you had one of your five floor plans, for example, that had that RV garage, it could be a niche and it would add to your absorption. And again, I'm kind of going after that right brain. What are those emotional things that they wouldn't find in the resale market that they'd be pretty excited about? Uh, that could be a, a great niche there. <clears throat> so what are the big opportunities out there? So we have to be smarter about just overcoming what their obstacles are. And again, that's the left brain, kind of addressing their list. Um, the, the product side, what are those emotional things that are going to get them to move away from 30 years of their memories in the, in the home that they live in today? Because we know that's their biggest competition. And really understanding where are their pain points and then what are the things that are, are really going to make them cross the finish line. And then providing, providing those new solutions that aren't just addressing the checklist, but that are kind of a really neat surprise. And I definitely saw some as I was looking at the, the top performers in Southern California. Definitely educate them on the, your brand as well as the brand you're putting into your home because that's going to help them make decisions uh, both virtually uh, and it'll make the process go faster. Um, a lot of them said, I said, well, do you buy on Amazon? I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of virtual purchases today. I've seen. And they said, yeah, but I'm buying the brands I know came up a lot. The other thing that they said was, you know, obviously it's not quite the, the same price point. So, you know, and that's fair for sure. So as we look at uh, the 55 plus communities that are actually thriving, so I looked at all the ones that were actually still selling somewhat well, if not really well, um, these were some of the common trends that I saw for sure. I'm gonna throw some of these pictures up. So obviously the communities that had great locations, so like Pulte Del Webb in Rancho um, Mirage is actually selling very well. Um, even uh, some of the more affordable price points for Lennar here in Irvine are also selling very well. Now I'm sure in both categories there's probably incentives and, and things that they're encouraging realtors to come out and so forth there too, but at the same time those are still moving during uh, tougher times for sure. Um, communities where people are active and present and that strong social programming um, that I love when people will say to me, you know, I wouldn't go to a community where uh, I didn't see people. I, that's when I on uh, wellness and fitness programs, and I want to know that this is the right decision for my spouse and I, or for myself. Um, in Orange County, products that were under 750000 that were attached seem to be uh, doing very well. I don't think that's an FHA thing. I think it's just a, a mental barrier. So that means you're looking for consumers that own a home that are probably not million to a million two. And then for the Inland Empire, it seemed to be uh, communities under $450,000. So again, that is you're looking for that buyer that owns a house that's in that seven to $800,000 price point that's cashing out and moving to the Inland Empire. So those are interesting, interesting things to look at. So uh, Pulte out at Terramore uh, seemed to be doing pretty well. Um, and again, as I mentioned, uh, Rancho Mirage uh, seemed to be doing pretty well. The other thing too is, is just solid product design on the inside and the outside. It was interesting to me to see people really focus in this buyer group on exterior design, not just interior design. And it, actually, I don't think I put that slide in here, but I was surprised exterior design was more important than interior design to this consumer, although it was neck and neck for boomers. Um, also size seemed to be uh, fairly important too. And I think it's because of the price tag of staying in Southern California and, and what they're really looking for to accommodate. So again, I threw some of these images up here on the right. Um, I'm going to underscore none of these are actually in Southern California. So 
um, just creating those exciting lifestyles. They certainly could be in Southern California, but the indoor pool and just those, those wow community centers, I certainly have seen some great one. I love the amenities at Terramore. I think they did a phenomenal job. And then uh, just some of the more exciting outdoor spaces that Toll Brothers has been known to do. And again, just that great indoor outdoor feel. I do believe uh, some of those open floor plan concepts are gonna shift more for families. Uh, I think they'll still uh, remain very, very popular amongst the older buyer for sure. So just other categories, I do a lot of work throughout the country and, and help a lot of different groups throughout the country that are just special. I wanna point out this outdoor space because this is perfect outdoor space for this consumer. They want privacy and they want entertainment. So just tucking this in here, it's, it's very private, yet they have this just incredible feature for the inside and outside of their home. And so it's such a, that's definitely a right brain pool there for sure. Um, other things that I've seen throughout the country and that I've worked on um, more so on the East Coast, certainly than the West Coast, but I'm seeing a lot of uh, ver vertical opportunities for the active adult, whether it's targeted in a great location or even qualified with, the great, with great amenities. This feels young, it feels hip and cool and the rooftop deck, I mean, these are things that uh, this buyer can't really point to something else in the resale market um, <clears throat> to buy. And so if I'm selling my pretty vanilla suburban single family detached home, and even moving to a farther distant location or moving to a great location, this is pretty exciting to show your friends, your family, and it, it feels young, it feels great. And I would not eliminate this as long as you're uh, willing to throw in an elevator. And I've seen this do very well. There's a community on the East Coast called uh, Brambleton. They did all four story products. They assumed they'd get all Gen X and Gen Ys and 80% were boomers. Um, because it just, it's hip, it's cool, it's fun. And uh, that buyer, uh, they were all moving out of uh, suburban single family detached homes. Other great things, just kind of special things that you don't expect. So just this little pop-up in this family room space off the kitchen, just, it really makes a difference. It just, it feels good. And I love having sort of uh, this feature off, you know, surrounding that fireplace, connecting to the outdoor space. Uh, this is a product that, um, pre-shade trilogy that I, I worked on and we helped design, which is a vertical duplex. And the reason this was so crucial is we really wanted to maximize the views. And so when you got up to that um, second level, and by the way, serviced by an elevator included feature, that's why we did it. And so everybody thought we were nuts. They thought there was no way people are gonna get to the $500,000 price point uh, for this product in Vegas, because right across the street was four to the acre single family detached on a golf course, uh, you know, at 250 to 300,000, and this was double the price. And now it's more than double that price uh, today and um, has sold very well. Um, just other kind of simple, great features. This is Christopher Holmes in Las Vegas. They did a modern duplex again to really maximize the view. But these, again, uh, a lot of move downs, non-family, uh, probably the most exciting product in Las Vegas. I would say it is the most exciting uh, product for sure in Las Vegas. Sits up on a hillside and it just, it's really special. There, not only is the architecture great, uh, the merchandising um, was done, done by Design Tech. It was phenomenally done. Uh, it just really felt great. I'd move for that. It was fantastic. Here's a, a speaking of privacy and entertainment, uh, this was fantastic. So again, it's cozy, it's wonderful. Uh, you're highlighting the best part of the location there. And uh, I could see myself having a cocktail right now with that. <laughs> it would be great. Um, but it must be emotional. And I think that's the big thing I, I hope the takeaway today is for this buyer. I also want the takeaway to be uh, the market hasn't stopped. It is moving despite the fact that 95% of consumers are at home today. Uh, they are moving. And so let's just hit some of the big conclusions here. Home's more important today than it has been I, for the last hundred years, if not more than that. Um, I can't think of a time historically where 95% of all consumers uh, were quarantined at home. Uh, technology is expected. Just think about making life easier and don't go overboard there. Uh, Multi-generational uh, housing is important for this one because it's all about their guests visiting and they want people to come visit them, especially those people that mean the most to them. 
health and wellness, uh, a huge advantage to separating the home that you're selling to the one that they own, not to mention all that competition out there. Um, new sales platforms, they're evolving throughout the country. We actually have a whole webinar going on uh, at the end of May. Miss Gina Nixon is going to be with me on that webinar. And we're going to involve some of the best experts in the country, of which I think Gina, of course, is one of those. And we're going to talk about how, what's working, what's not working, and, and things to think about there. But just remember, uh, they trust the brands they know. It has to be thought of uh, throughout this. Um, consider any easy program uh, to buy their home to make the transaction easy. So, uh, for example, their biggest concern is having people come into their home. So provide tools to help sell their home for them, you know, whether it's the tools that, you know, are already there online that will do that for them, but partner to get their home sold so they don't feel like they have to have hundreds of people walk into their home with the risk of uh, catching a virus and all the things going on today. And um, assure them a safe environment if they do come in for that visit, and I know all of you are doing that, um, but just that's one of those things that you almost want to address immediately, like, you know, we're super uh, we're ultra, ultra clean and sensitive and, and we really want you to come in because we know that personal touch for you is important. And oh, by the way, we'll set it up to where you can come by yourself and, and walk the home with your husband. We'll just give you a code to come in, let us know when you're done and let's hear. So we don't even have to be there for you. And I really think for this buyer, that's a big deal. Um, without a doubt, there's uncertainty in the market and their biggest concern is their own financial well-being long-term. And so you really have to point out the things like if home prices drop, so does their equity. So let's get you moving and let's get you in this, this place, space, and time in your life that you really should be enjoying. Um, give them something unique and fresh to see. So those special features, some of which I showed you. And then of course, last but not least, uh, just point out to them, like, why are you waiting? <laughs> Enjoy your life now and, and point out that opportunity uh, to live now and uh, friends and family and all of that are going to come with this uh, but what why not enjoy it today so um, for anybody who wants to be involved in the survey we are launching and uh, we are in the middle of that launch and if you haven't received packages and you've launched with us before you are going to receive those this week um, and then if you haven't just reach out it's all complimentary this is sort of it's been my give back for years and this is kind of my job uh, that I do nights and weekends and, and all those other things because I just really believe in it and I think it's crucial. And then as I mentioned, we have a webinar on May 26th at 11 a.m. Uh, if you want to uh, attend that, just shoot me an email. I'll make sure you're on uh, the distribution there, but uh, we will be sending out an invitation for that too as well. And with that, I think we're pretty close to the time uh, we projected for this, which uh, is about uh, an hour and a half. And I'd open it up for any questions or turn it back over uh, to Katya. Thank you, Molly. First of all, thanks for a great presentation, lots of valuable information. I know that a lot of people have asked throughout if this uh, presentation will be available. And the answer is yes, we will be sending it out this afternoon. But uh, there were also a few uh, key questions that just came in. And maybe I start here at the uh, a question from Tim McCauley. Uh, he's asking, was HOA dues addressed in the surveys? Big challenge for us at $745. It was, um, and uh, it really does change, Tim, depending on the price point and the location, and then what you're giving to them for that service. So while I would tell you, um, for all active adult and boomers out there, you know, sort of that tolerance level, is in the 250 to 350 and below. And frankly, it's really more towards the 250. 70, 50, 750 is definitely steep, but here's the one thing I would tell you because I've gone through this very exercise myself when I considered uh, moving to a, a high rise and was looking at those HOAs. I would create a handout with everything they get for that 750. Because so my lawnmower guy is 100, my pool guy is 125, my trash is this. And, literally have a handout and say just let's do a quick little worksheet on what you're paying right now so that they can really start to measure up to that 750 because they're going to get to that 750 pretty darn fast so just really uh, give them the right tools to understand what that 750 includes but yes that is high and there would be a lower percentage for that 
but I have overcome that myself in the sales and marketing world in my 30 plus year career with doing exactly that. Have a worksheet, point out to them what that 750 is about. Great, thank you. Uh, here's another question from Megan Eltringham at the New Home Company. Actually, there's like three questions in here. So I start with the first one. Do you feel that smart automation or smart home features are important in general to have standard in the home? Or is, it, or is this something that we can consider having an option? You know, Megan, so uh, the great thing is, is we, we did launch for the New Home Company. Uh, I hope you guys launch again here in the near future. I would want to know how that changes by price point, and then I would address that depending on uh, what project you're working on, and then I would also create packages for this and say, look, our, our base home covers all the things that are really important, like, you know, the camera at the front door and the back door and solid security program, and here's what's included in that, but we also know there are some incredible features uh, that can make life even easier. And let me show you what you know, the, the two packages are that you could have. And here's what that looks like. The real key on the, the technology features that I would also point out for this consumer is, you know, this is another uh, $10,000, for example, for this. And I, I know that seems like a lot, but at the end of the day, that's $50 a month if you want to put it in your, you know, monthly payment and that doesn't go anywhere. I mean, be pointing out the, the value to them monthly and how that might offset it particularly as it relates to obviously a solar and net zero, uh, those should always pay for themselves for sure. But the, the true technology stuff, um, I'd be looking at that by price point and I definitely have a foundation that standard, but I would not go overboard on my standards at all uh, because they're, everybody gets it today for the most part. They can go to Home Depot and buy half the stuff and be done for you know 800 to $1,000 on the key things that count a lot. Uh, and this buyer less than Gen Y. Interestingly enough, Gen Y is far more paranoid that everybody's watching what they're doing than this buyer. <laughs> um, this buyer, I think, is like, hey, if you've got the time, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I think um, I would have a strong foundation and then I would offer packages above mm -hmm. and beyond. That. Perfect. Um, second part of the question, have you heard of any air filtration systems coming standard in homes? Yes. Um, okay. In fact, I think that's going to grow phenomenally over the future, quite frankly. Um, yeah. Air filtration, it, it costs you anywhere from, I've seen it to be like three to $500 to put in your home. We asked consumers if they would pay $1,000 for air filtration. Uh, depending on the price point, it was 50 to 70% said yes. Uh, they wanted that in their home. And that's such an easy way to sell against your competition. Like, you know, if healthy air is not important to you, buy across the street. But like here, you know, what you breathe is important to us. I mean, that's, it's such a great <laughs> selling tool that doesn't cost you a lot. Great. Um, and then the last part, anything else in this area with COVID that we need to prepare for to include or design for in the future? You know, some of the, the categories I address for the boomer market, I will tell you, I did a whole presentation on this last week that addresses all markets. And I would tell you the biggest categories for this buyer is, um, again, if they're working at home, you need more than one office or more than one office space. Uh, fitness at home is crucial because this buyer is working out every day because wellness and fitness is, is crucial to their longevity. Um, I don't see spaces actually, um, and, you know, departmentalizing or being more visible for this consumer because it does tend to be one or two people in the household. For the family buyer, I am actually projecting and predicting that we're going to see more divisible space because people need privacy and noise barriers and things like that with, you know, homeschooling and two people mm -hmm. working out of all of that stuff. So, right. uh, yes, there's quite a few things I addressed in this presentation. And if you didn't see the one from last week, again, email me. I'll shoot you a link to that one as well. Uh, you'll see some similarities from this presentation to that presentation, but they're distinctly different with a distinctly different sample and, and audience as well. Perfect. Thank you, Molly. Uh, here's a question from Alice at Avenida Partners. Uh, she's asking, outside of fear of selling homes in this environment, do you know if seniors are overwhelmed with moving in general as downsizing and thought of moving is daunting for them? They don't know where to start. 
You know, uh, it's interesting. It, it, the biggest thing that came up in the interviews that we just did in COVID-19, uh, but even pre-COVID-19, it really has so much to do with letting go of the 30 years of memories than it does with the idea of moving. Um, they have the equity, they can pay someone to help them move in. And I, I think the painful part or the part that feels like you're ripping off the Band-Aid has to do with the memories built inside that home and, and leaving the family home that not only they connect to, uh, but their whole family connects to. So I, I think that's your bigger issue. So you, that's why that emotional thing in the right design is so crucial to get them over that because they can get excited and start telling their friends and family why they're moving and they can point to, and that's it. That's why, uh, that's why golf course communities and all of those do so well, not because they golf, but because they can say, Hey, I'm moving to a resort and I have all this stuff. And so you have to come out and see it. Um, so, uh, but yes, there's, there's no question. I think a move for anybody is, is a challenge and, and scary and all of those things today, COVID-19, uh, it's not just leaving their memories, but it's, uh, it's financial security that's making them the most nervous. Thank you. Um, here, there's a couple more questions. Uh, so this one is from Sam. He's asking what percentage of the housing in the OC is active adult? It's a great question, Sam. You know, I don't have the answer to that. Um, I could tell you the percentage that is in the new home market. And if you really wanted to see every active adult community in Orange County or in many places throughout the country, go to 55places.com. It is my, it's the go-to for active adult throughout the country. And you'll see every single active adult community here in Orange County and throughout. Uh, so that's a, a great resource for you. They'll also document every single amenity at every single active, active adult community as well. And their floor plans and their pricing. It's, it's a great resource for that. Great. Uh, the last one is from Marissa, and you may have answered that uh, because it came in uh, relatively early, uh, but she's asking, are these uh, preferences similar for the higher density active adult buildings? Um, that's a loaded question. So because uh, higher density active adult buildings, particularly in Southern California, tend to uh, be concentrated in the highest price locations. And so so we could break that out and I would underscore for all of the, the data that I present both here and in other webinars, you know, we're, we're answering a general answer for Southern California. And uh, I would encourage everybody as you're, as you're applying it to a specific project, that's where we can help and we can help quickly because we've got the resources we have. Um, that I would, uh, I would really look at that location and that price point and I would dial that in more deliberately. So the answer is, is that accounted for in this? And do we have uh, higher density alternatives in our sample size? The answer is yes. But I would, to answer a question project specific, we would answer that project specific and dial that data in more deliberate to your location, your price point and, and so on. Thank you. So I think that concludes uh, the uh, questions. Thank you again, Molly, for a great presentation and so much information that uh, you shared today. Again, we'll be emailing out the slides this afternoon. And uh, before we say goodbye, I just want to uh, take one minute to also thank today's underwriter. Uh, and today's sponsor is Mutual of Omaha Mortgage. Uh, with that, I'd like to say goodbye. Everybody stay healthy. And do, I hope uh, we see everybody at our next uh, webinar. Yes, thanks everyone for joining us. I appreciate it. And take care, be well, be safe. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Bye-bye. Thank you.